Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, superintendent's report. I have several items. Good evening. Um, first one <coughs> is an <coughs> indoor air quality update. Um, as you, you may know, the radon testing, retesting in Miller Driscoll School was conducted from February 19th through the 21st by a subcontractor of the firm Cardinal ATC. Similar testing was also conducted at Cider Mill, Middlebrook, and Wilton High School from period March 5th through 7th. The comprehensive indoor air quality assessment of Miller Driscoll was conducted last week, and we should be getting reports from the company, from the company um, sometime in April. And when we receive these reports, we will share this information with the public, with you and with the public, uh, clearly. Second item I have is on Acoustic Wilton. Um, the last Saturday, the Wilton Education Foundation held its annual spring Acoustic Wilton concert in the Little Theater. Um, this performance, uh, again, featured student performers and some community musicians, um, including some returning alumni, which is, is wonderful to see some of our alums coming back to help out. They performed some original creations and some well-known tunes. Uh, by all accounts, this was another great successful evening. This was the, the brainchild of uh, Scott Weber, uh, who's the co-chair of the foundation. And Scott is also a very talented musician who performs and is a great MC. Um, I missed it this year, but it, uh, everyone who attended, I don't know if any of you had a chance to take it in. Yeah. Uh, I get glad I talked about it. And uh, it, was a, it was, by all accounts, a great evening. <coughs> Some, excuse me. Some of the parents of the student performers uh, wrote to the foundation to express their appreciation for the opportunities their kids had had as performers. And one of them wrote, uh, we, we want to thank Scott for all he's done for our, our child. Uh, he opened up a world of music that we had never considered, and it's enriched all of our lives immeasurably, uh, which is really a nice uh, tribute to what another good thing the foundation's doing. Um, on a, a related note, um, one of our Wilton High School art teachers, Sue Brandt, and several of her students were asked by the foundation to document and take photos of the event. They took some 700 still photos that night, and they're working through. They're going to use them in various ways for the foundation. The foundation offered to uh, give them some compensation. Um, when they worked from 7 till 10, they, they did not accept any compensation, obviously. But, uh, the uh, Ms. Brandt uh, uh, did uh, make a comment uh, about her feelings about WEF and what, that, what it's meant to the faculty. Uh, she, she writes, the program last night was outstanding and we had a great time. The musicians were excellent, another testimony of the talent in our school. I just want to make it clear that I volunteered my time and effort since it's for such a great cause. WEF has been so generous toward summer professional development and she has, has engaged in some of the summer programs in past years. The web sponsored summer professional learning programs that I participated in have helped me stay current in the trends in photography as well as learn new techniques for editing as well as shooting photographs. I also I always bring back the information I learned from these workshops and use it with my students at the high school. So there's really a, a nice return on that investment from the foundation. Um, as the board knows, the foundation has raised the last couple of years in excess of $100,000. Some of you have been very generous and, and uh, helped support the foundation. Um, and that the money that is raised and donated to the district is used, as you know, in three areas uh, for technology enhancements. And we've, we've done a lot of, uh, purchased a lot of equipment over the years uh, through the foundation uh, generosity, uh, the arts, and professional learning. So they're the three major uh, focal areas uh, of the, uh, the foundation. Uh, their next big event is going to be on uh, Sunday, uh, May 25th, the day before Memorial Day, with the annual run, uh, 5K uh, walk run event, uh, which raises some uh, um, monies each year. More importantly, it's, it's a wonderful community uh, experience. <clears throat> it's grown over time. And uh, it, it's really a wonderful day, and you see families out there, and, and there's some of us who are clearly not joggers who can walk the 5K, and then there's some very competitive runners. Um, so the event keeps growing, uh, and we hope it will grow more. Uh, again, want to publicly thank uh, co-chairs Scott uh, Weber and Matthew Green, along with the energetic and committed volunteers, one of whom is Mr. Kesselman back in the audience here tonight. Uh, who spent many, many nights and days uh, helping uh, 
improved some of the technology and uh, capacity of the foundation. We really appreciate his work. <coughs> Excuse me. The uh, third item is another uh, uh, thing that says, I think, a great deal about our, our schools and our high school. It's uh, this year, 73 Wilton High School students uh, participated in the uh, St. Baldrick's uh, uh, event. Uh, you may have noticed uh, a lot of crew cuts uh, around town and uh, they uh, raised money, they raised this year $20,678 by shaving their heads or having them shaved. We actually have seven barbers in the community who come and, and uh, do this for us uh, pro bono. Um, the event this year was headed by Colin DeFelice with the help of Cooper Pelleton, Jack Howes, Roger Huglin, Emmanuel Satinas, uh, Price Reed, Ethan Michael, and advisor Dan Pompa. And, and Dan has been such a trooper over the years. He puts untold hours into this. He's the cheerleader, motivator. Uh, he keeps a running tab as they're collecting the, uh, the pledges and really does a fabulous job. Do any girls do it? Um, I don't know if, uh, Mr. O'Donnell, do we, I don't believe we had any, yeah, I don't remember any girls. Um, um, next item has to do with another high school item uh, with the uh, Colt. Um, uh, it's a lang world language poetry recitation contest. And uh, our students are active in a lot of areas. This is one of them. Uh, Fifteen of our talented uh, Wilton High School world language students competed in a statewide competition. It's called the Colt World Language Poetry Recitation, which was held on Monday, the 17th of March at C uh, Central Connecticut State University. And we had eight medalists in ancient Greek, Molly Hoke. Um, won a bronze medal. Kathleen Smith won gold. Um, in the French uh, uh, event, uh, Akia Amraskin won bronze, and Evelyn Z, uh, Evelyn Z uh, won silver. Uh, in German, Cassidy Haas won a bronze. Uh, Jessica, in Latin, Jessica Corpse, Corpsa won gold, and Aaron Bronner gold. And in Spanish, uh, Darden, is it Livesey, won a silver. So again, congratulations to our students and to the world language uh, people who prepare them for these uh, uh, events. Last <coughs> item is uh, the SBAC testing, which began this week. And I, I'd really like to take a few moments to thank uh, um, and commend the entire team, Maria's team at Middlebrook, and, and Maria for how smoothly the first few days of testing have gone. Um, the building administrators, I think, created, uh, by all accounts, an efficient testing schedule that really uh, not only supported student performance on the test, but minimized the disruption to instruction. Uh, they provided really good training for the staff, um, to, the, uh, to the test administrators uh, who are prepared to manage these sessions uh, and seamlessly handle uh, testing irregularities uh, should they arise. Um, as you know, this is not only a new focus for the test, but it's a new way of taking the test, and it's a field test, so it doesn't count. And they're, they're, uh, the state uh, districts around the state are participating in the field testing, um, and it requires an enormous <coughs> amount of technical support since we're doing online test computer testing for the first time. And I'd like to thank uh, Matt Hepfer and his tech organization uh, and all the uh, planning, careful planning, and, and it's been really months in, in the, uh, in the in the planning for this, uh, Matt and uh, Chuck and, and the principals have spent a lot of time um, with uh, uh, the principals and, and staff trying to help them understand, as have the principals. Uh, but uh, we, uh, this is really a, a new world for us, the online testing. Uh, we did, however, have a slight glitch. We were a little cocky after the first couple of days and we had a, a glitch today. <coughs> we had. Um, uh, when our system failed to operate due to a problem with the security filters we have in place, we have fil filters in our system that filter out inappropriate content. And uh, but but uh, all went well, and the students and staff really rose to the occasion, handled this challenge, uh, and the students uh, were able to reboot. Uh, they didn't lose any information, uh, and they'll continue tomorrow. Uh, Maria commented that, that they were really uh, classy and, and they were literally unfazed by it. Um, so it, it's really Matt uh, is working with the support team and he's had some very uh, serious conversations, as you might imagine, with the uh, supplier of our filters because uh, this is just not acceptable. And, and one of the reasons we do field tests is, 
is to try to make sure we're prepared for the day when these uh, tests uh, count. And so Matt's working real hard and he has a great plan that he had, like I said, talked to the vendors today about what happened. Finally, I'd like to compliment our sixth grade students. Uh, they worked really hard in unfamiliar uh, circumstances. I know over the years, I, Chuck and I and others have been at workshops where they've talked about online testing and, you know, how, how do kids adapt to it. And like many things, they adapt to things easier than we do, uh, and especially in, in areas involving technology. Um, the, uh, they were, we were really impressed with the kids' uh, patience and persistence and uh, believe that the uh, um, assessment will really provide some really meaningful uh, data and feedback on student performance. Um, one of the things that was interesting is that many of our kids uh, uh, commented that they liked the SBAC better than the CMTs. They found it, they enjoyed it, it was challenging, and it was more engaging, they, many of them said, and they, had, they didn't feel unprepared or overwhelmed by either the content or the technology. So, again, this is one school. We started with Middlebrook. We have the other schools. Will, it'll take place in May, I believe, after the uh, SAT and uh, AP testing is completed. So overall, the, the SBAC testing has been going, has gone quite well thus far, and we'll continue to monitor, monitor its impact on um, students, and uh, we plan to formally debrief on the entire experience um, uh, the schools have had during the, the testing, and we will report back and keep you informed as we, as we do that. So thank you for all of you, all the work you've done to um, help us uh, launch this initiative. I just wanted to add something to that because, um, you know, obviously I, We've heard a lot about the online testing, and I think there should be also credit given to all the schools because it's a really different culture. Um, those of us who have children at Middlebrook who are in the sixth grade, it's not just the children sitting at the computers taking the test, but the seventh and eighth graders, you know, and always you go in and you take the test, and the whole school is taking a test <coughs> at once, and all of a sudden they're moving between classes and they're learning that you can't, you know, I mean, they have to be very aware of what the sixth graders are doing, and I presume the sixth and yeah, they're all, and it's just a different culture right. to all the students as well. So thank you to all of Middlebrook for doing and the what you do. Have been very respectful as they're passing in the hallways. They know that the students are testing in the labs, and so that's a very good point. Thank you. Thank you. Committee reports. I have a committee report. <laughs> <laughs> Um, as you know, Chris and I have been tasked with um, coming up with metrics for the, the incoming superintendent's incentive, the incentive-based component of his, of his income. Um, we started our work and um, have agreed that the new superintendent's incentive-based compensation will be based on a series of metrics that are closely aligned with the strategic, or the public school's theory of action. Um, as we all know, the theory of action includes the key principles that drive our priorities in decision making, so it follows that we should set incentives for our superintendent that support those same principles. We're at the beginning of our discussions, and we would, but we've agreed that we would like to develop no more than five specific metrics, and they could look something like this. And again, you know, we're, I'm, we're sharing them with you tonight just to sort of get your feedback, see if any flags jump out or anything. One would be student outcome. Um, Chris came up with, with the, what I think is a fabulous idea of, a, of establishing a Wilton Success Index. All I could think of was the Misery Index, though. But um, <laughs> the Success That's not a great Index. <laughs> <laughs> the Success Index might be a figure that includes several components, including SAT scores, um, SBAC scores, um, graduation rates, AP participation rate, AT, AP success rates. Um, all fit into one single score. Um, that Again, that might be a metric we, we set for the superintendent to improve a, as a percentage our Wilton Success Index. Um, another metric would be fiscal responsibility, setting a goal for finding efficiencies in existing spending or for holding future budget increases to an agreed upon percent increase. In the area of human resources, and again these are tied to the theory of action, Establish a metric that affirms our desire to hire and develop the best teachers and administrators and to ensure they are encouraged to grow and pursue innovative approaches to education. In the area of curriculum development, a measurable go goal for integration of technology throughout the school day, a measurable goal for using technology to expand existing curriculum. Um, those of us who are on the search committee will remember that 
we talked about foreign language, finding ways to expand the use of foreign language, using what's available online and using existing resources. Um, and finally, with under the area of whole child, um, establish a process for every child to have a meaningful relationship with an adult at Middlebrook School and Wilton High School. Each metric will be designed to measure performance that goes beyond normal job expectations. At this point, we are thinking that each metric will be weighted equally, but as we continue our discussions, we may decide one, cate one category deserves a higher rating and would account for a higher percentage of the incentive pay pie. Um, again, we just wanted to share these ideas with the board tonight to give you an idea of our thinking, and we are very open to comments and other ideas. Um, also, it's worth noting, we're, we're trying to develop goals that are attainable, um, and that will truly help our students. Chris and I will continue to flesh out these ideas using inputs from the appropriate members of the staff and community, um, along with best practices from other districts. And of course, we will loop Kevin into the process at some point, too. Any comments, Steve? Want to take it in? Hmm. No, it's always a difficult thing to do. You know, to pick and choose, you know, the measurements and what you're going to measure and how you're going to measure it. It's well, one really thing we're finding is that most districts don't do this. I know. Yeah. Which is hard. You know, so it's not an easy task to first define what you're going to measure and how are you going to measure and what what is success, what does it mean? So it's not, you know. You know, clearly on the right track, I think something needs to be done. You know, the, the accountability has to be there. So. Okay, so we'll continue our work. Yeah. Let me park that. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Um, <coughs> we have a United Way presentation mm -hmm. from Dr. Cicchetti and Faith Douglas mm -hmm. of United Way. Welcome. Thank you. One of my responsibilities is to um, coordinate the United Way campaign every fall for the district, and I had the pleasure of doing that this year and working with uh, Faith Douglas. And Faith asked for an opportunity to uh, come before the board to um, share some thoughts on the uh, United Way campaign that we conducted in Wilton last October, November. So before you do that, I want to thank you for being so responsive to us and the amount of time that you spent with us meeting with every faculty, uh, either before or after school, uh, developing a wonderful um, slide presentation, um, very concise but very powerful in terms of the work that United Way does, uh, especially linked to education and to early literacy. So, thank you, Faith. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mike. And a special thank you to Dr. Richard Scary. You've been an amazing support for your ten years here. United Way has been present in the school system, so thank you um, to all of the members of the Board of Ed. You have been supportive for scores of years, and United Way has um, mer uh, merged a few chapters you may or may not know. We're called Coastal Fairfield County, so it's uh, 11 towns that we serve under one roof now. We're trying to save some costs with finance, and we um, have um, been spreading the spreading the, the good and the the trying to support the community, but it's really about kids in need, and a lot of our focus is the um, cities of Norwalk and, and Bridgeport, and that resonated with uh, the Wilton Public School System, with the faculty. In fact, like Mike um, describes, I was able to not only touch every faculty member at um, before and after school, and I really appreciate the, the principals and the the administrators who allowed that, but also there were team captains who were, um, they took their time out to be cheerleaders in the buildings to talk about what the United Way means and how it, how it can impact our community. So thank you. The, um, the United Way campaign raised close to $5,700 and when Mike and I first um, met, first of all, he is a United Way veteran and understands the, the challenge and the importance of that culture, and he brought that with him, which I certainly appreciate. And when we met, we thought about increasing participation rate. We did just that. We increased it by 18%. So it was a big, a big um, applause and a, a goal that we were really proud of. And on behalf of United Way, I say thank you. 
and I just have a little certificate for you, Mike, for your uh, for your support. And I I know it was just uh, short term. Is that it? I would really love for you to stick around next fall. And um, and uh, Gary, I just wanted to give you, on behalf of um, the Wilton Public Schools, a plaque of our appreciation for your generous support to the community and to your for your commitment to improving lives of kids in need. So thank you. I'll do as I'm asked. Let them hold the phone. Yes, hold it. He did the work, so he, he should be no, no. in the picture. Uh, this, is, this is the more important recognition. So. Well, the, uh, the, Chris, why don't you, can you move over just to, um, a little bit this way, please? Sure. Do you want makeup first? Yeah. <laughs> you sure you don't want to be in the picture, Mike? I'd like him two, to be. Well, we'll take three. two pictures. Okay. Two, three. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, Faith was so generous with her comments. Uh, Mike did a great job this year. And, uh, many of you remember for eight years, Ellen Andrews really uh, energized the campaign and along with the principals uh, did a great job. So it's been a, a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Um, next, under review and discuss, Dr. Smith. A update on the teacher evaluation <coughs> and professional learning plan. Okay, so <clears throat> I wanted to give you, uh, wanted to review with you some potential changes we're going to be making to the teacher evaluation plan and the process that we're going to need to go through to make those changes. Um, just in terms of context and background, some of you have may have heard or read about the fact that the governor at the end of April um, came out and announced that he felt that the state requirements for teacher evaluation were too onerous for districts to implement. I guess he did that based upon some feedback from stakeholders. Um, and so he asked the committee who's in charge, the state committee who's in charge of teacher evaluation to give districts some flexibility in terms of meeting those requirements. Um, and he made some very specific recommendations. So that committee, which is known as PEAC, P-E-A-C, uh, Performance uh, Evaluation <laughs> Advisory Council, okay. agreed with those recommendations and forwarded those to the State Board of Education, who adopted them. And then the state, uh, Connecticut State Department of Education then disseminated those options to districts with the direction that we were to meet with our own teacher evaluation committees consider those options, make some decisions as to whether we would avail ourselves of those options, um, and then gave us some direction on how we need to proceed uh, in terms of making those changes. So what I wanted to do tonight, again, was to share with you what those flexibility options are, what the committee has decided in terms of those options, and then what the process will be, okay? So right here we have what the new flexibility options are. I believe that you received this chart electronically and maybe in a hard copy in your packet. Yeah. Not in the packet, but we'll, we yeah. received it electronically. Yeah. Okay. So it was a much longer chart. What I've given you up here is the top half of the chart, which are the flexibility options. The bottom half are the actual requirements. They're not options, and I'll go, go over those in a minute. So you can see across the top column headings that they have teacher evaluation issue, current requirement, and the flexibility options. And the first um, issue is over-reliance on testing, which honestly I find to be a little perplexing because that's not the real issue. Um, you'll notice that the current requirement is that we use the CMT CAPT for a certain percentage of teacher evaluation. Well, we're not administering the CAPT or CMT. Um, it, I mean, the only the only time we're administering it right now is in grades 5, 8, and 10 for science. So those tests don't apply to the vast majority of our teachers. So we kind of knew that we couldn't use it. Um, you'll notice that the option is that we don't use the CMT CAP or the SBAC. Well, the fact of the matter is we couldn't use the SBAC even if we wanted to. We didn't administer it last year, so teachers don't have a baseline for which to make goals from. And the test this year is a field test, and we won't be getting the scores back until January, 
which means the teachers couldn't set goals at the beginning of next year. Plus, we don't know what kind of scores we're going to be getting back. So those aren't real options, and that isn't a real issue. So, um, the second one is more of an issue, and that's the number of required formal observations for teachers rated proficient or exemplary. Now, I know there are some new members on the board, but for those of you last year who participated in the discussions about the plan, you'll remember that there was a rubric that we used to evaluate teachers, and it has a performance continuum of four levels. Mm -hmm. It starts with unsatisfactory, developing, proficient, and exemplary. So what we're talking about here are teachers who already have a proficient or exemplary um, rating. This also does not apply to first and second year teachers. And I want you to keep that in mind for, for something I'm going to say a little, a little later. In order to be tenured, it takes four years. So untenured teachers, we have year one and year two teachers, and year three and, uh, three and four teachers. But the state has chosen to take those tenured, untenured teachers and divide them into two groups. First and second year teachers, this doesn't apply to. This does apply to years three and four and to tenured teachers. And what they're saying here is that the current requirement is at least one formal in-class in observation per year and one to two reviews of practice per year. Now, a review of practice can involve an informal in-class observation or an observation of a teacher during a team meeting or a PPT or something like that. What I find interesting here is that we were told very clearly that we had to have two, but they're now saying that the requirement is actually one to two. Um, the flexibility options are to do at least one formal in-class observation of those teachers every three years with three informal in-class observations for the off years, and then one review of practice each year. You'll notice that they took that one to two review reviews of practice and broke it into something more specific in the flexibility options. There will be a review of practice that's not an informal observation every year, including the year of a formal observation, and that there will be three informal The next option is observations for non-classroom teachers take place in appropriate settings. Um, that's really a non-issue for us. We have been doing appropriate observations of non-classroom teachers. Um, and the last bullet has to do with how we would determine whether teachers were eligible for this option. So, oh, and I forgot to tell you at the very beginning, these options are for this year and next year. So if we were going to elect to take any of these options this year, we could use the teacher's ratings from last year to determine if they were eligible for this option. So if last year they were rated proficient or exemplary, they would be eligible for this option. And then finally, they're talking about student learning outcomes. And again, I find this very interesting because they put one to four per year. We were clearly told we had to do four. <laughs> and now all of a sudden they're saying, oh no, you There's actually could have only done one. <laughs> <laughs> Which is equally interesting that the flexibility option is to now do one when it was already an option. Mm -hmm. um, a, a student <laughs> growth objective, and it's actually a student growth outcome, um, is just a broad statement of what students will achieve in a particular area. So what I want to talk with you now about is what the um, our Teacher Evaluation and Professional Learning Committee has decided. We call our committee the Professional Evaluation and Learning Committee, PEEL. A little bit of a takeoff on PEAK. We've decided that we are not going to do any revisions this year uh, for a number of reasons. First, um, you know, we're two thirds of the way through the school year. Um, we were well on track to meeting all of the requirements, and in fact, for some of the teachers, we had already fulfilled the requirements. So to change it midstream would mean that some teachers didn't have to do certain things that other teachers did have to do, and we didn't think that was good. We also felt it would be confusing for teachers. It was hard enough for them to learn this process. To now change it midstream, we just don't think was, was appropriate. Um, we also felt there was some benefit to going through the whole year with the plan and then stepping back and evaluating. 
but we are going to recommend some revisions for 14 and 15. We already knew that we weren't going to use the CMT cap and SBAC, but we will make that a formality in the plan. Um, we will go with one student learning outcome. And as I mentioned, that's a very broad goal of what students will achieve. There will be multiple what are called indicators of academic growth and development, IAGDs. And those are actually objectives with numbers in them. So teachers will write very specific goals called IAGDs about um, students making improvement. So usually they'll take that broad um, goal. Uh, students will improve a year in their reading abilities and break that into several specific objectives, IAGDs. And what they most likely will do is to take groups of students in their class and set specific goals. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, children who are relatively high achieving, they will set one goal. For students who are more in the middle, they will set a different goal. Or students who are achieving at a lower level, they will set a different goal. So that we will have multiple indicators for that one goal. It's also possible that they could use different assessment instruments with the same students. But there will be multiple objectives on each of the goals. Again, so what does it mean sure. to have one student learning outcome measured? This is where we're trying to evaluate teacher effectiveness, I guess. <coughs> right. So give me an example. A single teacher performs one of these? Or is we'll measured? set one broad goal. And again, one they're broad very goal. broadly stated goals. The students in my class will improve one year's growth on the Gates beginning. And this applies to all teachers in all schools? Yes. And that, so how does a high school teacher describe that? Well, a high school teacher might say, for instance, all the students in my Algebra one class will pass the final exam with a certain school. And what about Algebra two? That won't be measured? That won't be part of the evaluation? Uh, for that Algebra one teacher? I don't know. Does okay. a math teacher teach Algebra one and Algebra two? Mm -hmm. Actually, they could have multiple learning objectives. We're only going to ask them to write if they're teaching multiple classes, if that's what your question is. Yeah, or a science yes. teacher that teaches chemistry and biology. Right. They have to set a goal that um, addresses the majority of the students that they work with. Right? Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. So they, the state law has always been that you don't have to write a goal for every student that you work with, but it has to be for the majority of the students that you work with. Okay, as an example, so I don't know what happens in high school, but do are there teachers, science teachers, that teach chemistry and biology? Yes. <coughs> there are, right? And there, and there are math teachers with different assignments, if you perhaps. So if a math teacher had three sections of algebra two and three of geometry, and two of geometry, so five in total. they would focus on the one they teach three of the majority of their classes, which would be the algebra two, for example. For example, so they may, they may teach 100 kids. They'd focus on the class, the sections that comprise 60, and then they'd write an objective uh, that would be broad enough to encompass some measurement of the progress they've made teaching those 60 kids. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. That's for purposes of what's mandated by the state. Yes. Now, what do, what do we do as a school district in evaluating whether or not the teachers are effective at educating the children? How, how else do we, how else do you assess the performance of teachers? Presumably, there are processes and measures that go well beyond that which is mandated by the state, or maybe not. I'm just, that's more of a question. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly I believe this is, I'll have the principals talk to this, but during the goal setting conferences, we talk about all of the kids, mm -hmm. but we only set goals for certain ones. You know, it's really important to understand that the purpose of this is for teachers to focus on improving their practice and having some measure of how they're improving their practice. They can't work on multiple practices at once. It's just not good pedagogy to work on many things. So for instance, if I want to get better at questioning, mm -hmm. I want to get better at questioning and measure that with a certain group of students. Then the following year, if I achieve my goal or if I didn't achieve my goal, we can have another conversation about how we might broaden that or focus on something different. But what we're trying to get away from, and that's why we're decreasing the number of goals <coughs> and observations, and I'm going to talk about this more in a minute, is to bring this down to a level that is manageable for teachers in terms of improving their practice. I don't want to take up a lot of time at mm -hmm. uh, Chris's board meeting because I know it has to end in 59 and a half minutes. Uh, but uh, <laughs> is, this, is this information somewhere documented that I could read it and digest it? How, how we evaluate teachers? Is there a, a, a document someplace yes, available? It's called for Consumption Evaluation Plan. 
There it is. Okay, so I can read that. I can find it on the website. Um, I don't know if we we'll put it on the website, but I can certainly give you a Thanks. copy. Thanks. Copies to the board. The yeah. thing is, though, we're in the midst of revising it. So I'll be um, I'll be well versed in what used to happen. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll get you a draft copy. Well, of I'm, I'm going to talk more about the process. <coughs> in a bit. Okay. So we're not going to uh, recommend any process changes for untenured staff. And I want to remind you that discussion we had before the state was just looking at untenured teachers year one and two. We are not going to make any changes for untenured teachers one, two, three, and four. We believe it's very important that we have a fairly rigorous uh, process for evaluating untenured <coughs> teachers. The only exception is that we are going to add something to their requirements, and that's an in-depth unit of instruction in year three. And I'll explain what a, a unit of instruction is in a minute. <coughs> and actually, just so that you know, for untenured staff, they have to have, if they're in year one and two, two formal observations and one informal observation. If they're in year three and four, they have to have one formal and two informals. And we'll now be adding this intensive, in-depth uh, unit of instruction in year three. Now, the process change that we are going to make is for tenured teachers who have been rated as either proficient or exemplary. And you'll notice here that I have the word accomplished in parentheses. That's another change we're going to make. We're going to change proficient to accomplished. Um, proficient has some connotations for teachers that they don't like. Uh, if you recall in the CMT, the middle level for students was they were proficient, where our goal was always mastery. So teachers don't like being called proficient. Um, it's just a word. It's, it's still the same level, but that word was troublesome to many teachers. So we just, we talked about different words that we could use, so we're going to go with accomplished. What we are going to propose, and this does not exactly meet the requirements of what the state has given us, is an in-depth unit of instruction every four years for those teachers. Now a unit of instruction is a series of lessons that are centered around a theme or a topic or a concept. Um, it's usually anywhere from 10 to 15 to 20 lessons that are put together. And research shows that although it's important for teachers to be able to um, design and implement a good lesson, what's more important is that they're able to string a series of lessons together into a coherent whole. So what we would like to do is to evaluate those teachers using an in-depth unit of instruction. And that involves a pre-unit conference where they have to lay out the entire plan for the unit. Then they will be conducting the unit for at least 10 lessons, if not more. Um, and then they will have a post-unit reflection where they evaluate how the students did, present data, and talk about how they could have done the, the, the unit better. Um, during that unit of instruction, there will be one formal observation, several informal observations. Can you um, sure. maybe clarify the difference between, you know, I have, for this set of units, I have a prescribed curriculum that's already mm -hmm. given to me. So then what's the difference between that and my plan that I'm the putting units, together? The unit plans that we have, the curriculum, mm -hmm. is not so specific that it wouldn't involve some planning on the part of the teacher. There is still, you know, you always have to take the curriculum and adapt it to the needs of the kids that are sitting in front of you. You still have to decide which books you're going to use. What kind of media you're going to use, yes. that kind of thing. Okay. Right. How you're going to check for understanding. You know, how you're going to give feedback, what particular assignments. So there, there is still a lot of work. You know, teachers are professionals. We hire them to make important decisions. And it's, these are the decisions that teachers have to make. Okay. We also feel that this unit of instruction will give us sufficient data to make a decision about what teachers' ratings should be. Right now, we're doing you know, a couple of formal observations, or for these teachers, actually one formal observation during the year, and then a, re a couple of reviews of their practice. Yet we're being asked to collect data, and I think it's well over a dozen indicators so it makes it very difficult to really make a reliable rating with such a, sh a small sample. Um, by doing an in-depth unit of instruction, when we look at their plans, we're going in both formally and informally for a period of two weeks, and then looking at their reflection, 
we're going to have sufficient data to be able to rate the teacher on all of those indicators. Those ratings will carry forward during the next three years. But what we will be doing on the off years is continuing to do informal observations. And the focus of those informal observations will be what's called their professional area of growth. So during the unit of instruction, we will be identifying an area that a teacher needs to work on. You know, whether they need to get better at questioning, about giving feedback, content organization and delivery, differentiation. Now remember, these are tenured teachers who are already rated as proficient. Mm -hmm. So for the, what's that? Accomplished. Accomplished, yes, thank you. <laughs> um, it'll take me a while to get used to that. And so the focus for the, for the intervening years, for their professional learning and the observations, will be on that area of professional growth. Um, it takes teachers a while to get better in their practice. And we feel that um, by focusing, we will see a greater amount of growth. Um, right now, we're collecting data on all of these indicators for teachers who are already considered proficient. And it's just become an onerous task at this point. We're collecting data for the sake of collecting data and to confirm things that we, for the most part, already know about our teachers. So we want to be able to bring some focus and coherence to this process, and we think this would be the way to do it. And we will also be doing a review of practice each year. Will the teachers be able to choose what unit of instruction you observe? Yes, for the most part, we will be giving them some choice. So they get the choice. Okay. Yeah. Now, there are going to be parameters around that choice, but they, there will be some okay. choice. <coughs> Who? The 10,000 questions. <laughs> um, who is doing this evaluation, let's say, of the unit of instruction? Who is meeting with the teacher to review the prep? Who is observing? Who is doing the recap at the end? Mm -hmm. Each uh, teacher is assigned an evaluator, and it's either the principal or one of the assistant principals. Okay. And also people in central office serve as what are called contributing evaluators. Okay. But those are primarily <coughs> unattended staff. Right. What happens when our evaluation of an accomplished teacher tells us that that teacher is not so accomplished anymore? Well, that's a complicated question. No, it's not. If well, a teacher, all I, of a sudden through our evaluation, doesn't measure up to whatever the ranking is to be considered accomplished, what right. happens? Well, I, that, that helped me because I need some clarity in terms of what you said. If at the end of the year we no longer have data to support rating them as accomplished, then their rating is either developing or unsatisfactory. Okay. And that will trigger certain um, things that need to be done, like a, a structured support plan or something like that. Right. Well, is that the, the next phase? I mean, I, I think it's, you, you are showing us a plan to deal with accomplished and exemplary teachers. Yes. Which are really pretty good. What about the teachers that aren't? Well, that's and, explained in the existing plan. And I, what I'm I, sharing I with I, you. Maybe we'll get the existing plan. Yeah, so I think it's right, you and yeah. Chris are best familiar with that. The only no, thing I was right. sharing with you today were the changes that we're making to the existing plan. Okay. And from my understanding, I wasn't here last year, but I believe the board spent quite a bit of time with yeah. um, mm -hmm. Ms. Anderson. Oh, yeah, the, a lot of time. Um, <laughs> Quite right. Discussing and approving and adopting okay. the, the current. Right. Well, that last change should be um, considerably time saving. Yeah, You're these hoping. seem like good yeah. changes, right? Yes. Awesome. Yes. Now, again, they want it every three years. We're proposing every four years. We'll have to wait and see whether the state department well, goes for it. Stick well, by again, that. I think we're going <laughs> above and beyond what the state wants. They just want a formal observation. We're doing an in depth unit of instruction. Right. So that will be the argument that I will make to the state. Department. See if they go for it. I also want you to understand that if during the intervening years a principal during an informal observation, although they are focusing on that area of growth, if they see something that's of concern, they can still, you know, change processes. If we need to move somebody back to the regular process, we will do so based upon the evidence that we get. I think one of the things to respond to your question, Mr. Trump, is that, that the uh, it, it is complex because you're looking at so many different variables. You know, you're looking as we evaluate staff. You're looking at, at uh, what's in, on the, at the baseline. What is in their knowledge of the content area that they're teaching? Um, what if we're, we're assessing the teaching methodologies they're using uh, to try and make it. You know, their, all the research is suggesting that more student-centered approaches are more effective rather than lecture mode, which many of us, you know, which is what college is used to be about and which is changing. 
uh, looking to see if people differentiate the instruction to students. Um, I, we look to see how they're engaging students. Uh, what are the interactions like? Uh, uh, are they patient? Are they respectful? Are they appro you know, appropriate in the way they're talking to kids to, to you know, maintain kid, people's dignity? Um, we look at the assessments that they're developing to, uh, and the quality of the assessments to see, you know, at one point, assessment and education with a lot of multiple choice tests, and we're really moving far away from that kind of assessment. Uh, we look at, at the, obviously, the outcomes that Chuck spoke about, you know, the, what students know, what they can do, what their attitudes <coughs> are about learning, about, you know, uh, so, so we're looking at how teachers promote that. Uh, we're looking at they, if, if they um, are, are willing to grow professionally. And we do, to Mr. Henley's question, I think we do, uh, and I think Chuck mentioned this, we put a, a great deal of emphasis in the first four years. Sometimes we don't give people four years. If it's, if it's clear to us that, that this is not a good fit, you know, after one year, and sometimes we've done it <laughs> after several months, uh, we part company. Um, and the, the, the question is a good one that was raised about how do we help people uh, grow and, and work with them who, who maybe no longer um, performing at the level that we expect. Uh, and, and I think that that's, uh, that's important work as well. We don't shy away from that. And we have put very experienced people on you know, improvement programs. And if that doesn't work, then you, you can take it to, to other levels. And uh, we have moved people out of the profession, made them available to industry, uh, is what uh, some people described it as. But, uh, uh, and we don't do that you know, capriciously, and, and we do it with, with uh, great purpose and, and sensitivity. But there are times when, when people no longer deserve to have the, the position. Uh, and uh, um, so, so we really, it, it's, a, it's a very challenging area and one that we take seriously. I think the problem we faced and the state is facing, and, and Chuck has pointed out, is just that the overwhelming amount of time that, that uh, this has taken. Uh, it's important work. But it's difficult when you <coughs> look at, at how many, how many um, Bob, are, are you evaluating as a principal? How uh, many teachers? Teachers are you evaluating? I have uh, 15 teachers, a number of classified staff, okay. and many of them are non-tenured, so I'm going in multiple observations. Yeah. So it's, um, it's a lot of work. It's important work, but it's the, the tracking of it and the data collection has been more onerous. And a lot of the feedback, both from the administrative and the teacher end, is there's more time spent trying to, you know, document the work and really focus on quality instruction and the face-to-face -face with the teachers to develop their skills. So that's one of the issues that we've been confronted with. And I think that's what you might hear statewide at this point. I think that the plan that, that this, the state came down with, and it, it in many ways is very clunky, and we're trying to figure out how do we do something that's worth the time we want to put into it. And you don't want to be doing something just to be in a, in what some uh, superintendents have described or trainers as, as compliance mode, where you're just checking that, check it off. We want to do this with purpose and with, with uh, fidelity to, to trying to help people grow. And if they can't grow, um, part with them. So it, it's, it's really been a huge undertaking and one that uh, was, I think has got a lot more uh, iterations ahead of it. Yes. Um, I will watch with great interest. <laughs> <laughs> I think if there's one message to all of this, and Gary's been trying to, to touch on it, is that the focus of teacher evaluation is really to help people to grow. There is that component of making sure that we separate people who aren't meeting expectations. But for the vast majority of teachers, this is our mechanism for getting them to improve their practice. We can't do that if we are in a compliance mode and collecting data on a myriad of different behaviors and not having time to have really focused and extended discussions with people about that area that they really need to grow on. And that's the, the real value our teachers have said is the conversations about our practice uh, and thoughtful work that's being done uh, to, to really look at teaching uh, and look at the science of it and the art of it and trying to, to really tease out ways of helping people uh, get better. And what's exciting is that many of our greatest teachers who've been around for many years are, are their own harshest critics. And they will point out, I want to do better in this area of my, my practice. Uh, I, I heard a thing recently, I was at a, a conference and they, they were talking about neurosurgeons who were really, you know, you talk about the peak 
one of the top parts <coughs> of the medical profession who hire uh, other people to coach them to become better surgeons. And that's, that's uh, the humility to, ha to recognize your need for improvement that we all have. So I, we're, we're excited about that part of it as well as the, and some of the other parts we're trying to minimize the drudgery and, and get to uh, putting our energy into the um, places where we get the highest reward for the effort. If I could just give you an example before I move on to this last part. In my experience as an administrator, not here but in other districts, we've had teachers setting goals. But they weren't rated on those goals. And one thing that this does by actually rating teachers is that I'm concerned that they're lowballing their goals because if they don't achieve their goals, they're rated lower. Whereas in my experience, if we have teachers setting goals but we don't rate them on it, they're going to have very big stretch goals. And so I, that's my concern. That we, it's not that setting goals is bad, but we have to do it in a way that's respectful and that will encourage teachers to really stretch and do the best they can. Just my two cents. Um, this is the requirements. These aren't options. And I, I'm obligated to tell you about this because it's going to involve you a little later on. The issue is onerous data collection. Now, I want to preface this by telling you that the state was pushing a program called Bloom Board for managing their uh, teacher evaluation. It's not one that we chose to go with, but there have been many, many problems <coughs> with it. Um, been a bit of a disaster, actually. So I think that is why they put this in as a requirement. Um, what we basically have to do is that as a teacher evaluation committee every year, we have to collect information, uh, opinions of people about how well we're doing with the data collection instrument. Um, and then report back to the board the results of that analysis. Um, we actually have kind of already done that. We didn't go with Bloom Board. We went with something called ProTrax because it was a system we were already using for professional learning. And they, we were just able to roll the teacher evaluation process into that. Um, very early on, we discovered that it was a bit of a clunky system. And the committee uh, looked at different options. And we're already moving to a new one called Talent Ed, which we found to be much more uh, user friendly. The interface is better, much more efficient. And in fact, uh, Richfield and New Canyon and Greenwich are moving to that as well. But I will come back by September 15th and tell you how well Talent Ed has been doing. By the 15th? Well, it says by the 15th, yes. <laughs> We're not starting until July 1st, so I don't know how much we'll be able to share with you, but we can certainly do that. But I want you to know, the point of this is Short that presentation. we have been well aware that we need to look at the, the usability of our data management system, and that we've already made some changes. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so in terms of process, there's a little bit of a change. What the state has said is that first year teacher evaluation committee needs to adopt these options, or adopt some options if they wish to. Then we have to submit them, submit them to the state ed department by May 15th, and they will get back to us by June 15th as to whether they've approved them or not. And then I have to bring them before you for you to adopt them. Now, for those of you who were here last year, that is a bit of a change, because last year you had to adopt them first, mm -hmm. and then they had to go to the Board of Ed, I mean, to the State Ed right. Department. I guess there was a bit of a problem in some districts where the boards adopted them, and then the State Ed rejected them, and then it would require re-adoption. So they flipped it. I, I think that makes sense. But one of the reasons I wanted to share this with you today was because you know, I didn't want to do all of this work and go through all of these approvals if you <laughs> had any feedback or, or thoughts on this. So it's kind of a preview. Um, we are in the process of making these changes. We'll submit them in May to the State Ed Department. And then hopefully they'll get back to us. I would like to maybe present it to you in June. Um, technically, you have to approve it before September. But I think it would be good for us for you to approve it so that we can move forward during the summer. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Do you think the state will give their approval that quickly? They have promised us that they will. <laughs> so <laughs> interpret that as you wish. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Sorry. And we'll, we'll get the uh, plan then. That you have to and one of the things that we have, uh, 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 Mr. Kimberly raised an uh, important point, and we need to make sure we get this material to you well in advance so you have ample time 
to read read because you're thoughtful people and, and think of questions you have that can inform our uh, conversations with you and if there's more information you need we can prepare in advance so we will do a, a, a try to do the best we can to get this out as soon as we can I think Brad, both Chris and I need the current plan that yeah we will we will get copies Chuck of the uh, current plan to uh, yes I to do Thank you. Next on the agenda is a presentation from Matt and Chuck on Paddy. 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 It's a little late from like St. Irish Paddy. Dating my Paddy. We'll explain what that means. Thank you. We'll be experts in yes. a few minutes. Yes. Yet another okay. acronym. <laughs> yeah. 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 Okay, so Matt and I wanted to share with you some information about a professional learning activity that the district's involved in that we're very excited about. Um, and in fact, remember in my previous presentation, we talked about um, that issue about uh, over-reliance on testing? Well, this is actually a legitimate option to address over-reliance on testing. Um, so PADI is the Performance Assessment Design Initiative, and it's a program offered by the Tri-State Consortium to its member uh, districts. And it's um, run by a woman by the name of Giselle Martin Neep, who's a, a nationally known and very highly respected um, educational consultant. She uh, has a lot of expertise in the area of curriculum and assessment. Um, we're, we are participating in what is known as Cohort 3. Um, each year, a certain cohort of districts in the Tri-State Consortium were trained in this and now in year three. It's our <coughs> first year participating. Um, but what's great about being in this uh, um, program is that once you become a participating member, you have access to all of the performance assessments uh, developed by all of the cohorts over the past three years. So we actually now have available to us dozens and dozens of very high quality performance assessments that we could either use or take and adapt to, to our own needs. Um, so what is a performance assessment? A performance assessment is an assessment in which students have to perform what's known as an authentic task, as opposed to a paper and pencil task. And by authentic, what we mean is that it is engaging, which means that students are actively and cognitively engaged in their own learning. That it's meaningful, which means it has some significance to the students because it um, requires that they um, form opinions, make decisions, solve problems, um, create products or um, do a performance. And that it's relevant, that it, they can somehow relate directly to what the task is. Um, and so we have two teams, one from Middlebrook and one from Cider Mill who are participating. Um, at Cider Mill, it's a classroom teacher, a library media specialist, and a leader, uh, literacy specialist. And I'm actually facilitating that group. At Middlebrook, it's the STEM teacher, uh, two social studies teachers, one of whom is the tech IL, right? Correct. Um, and Matthew is facilitating that particular team. Um, so let me just see where I am on this. And so uh, I think you're ahead of me here. I hope that's not confused. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so what these teams are learning is how to construct. Um, very, you know, valid and rigorous performance assessments. Um, and we're doing that by following certain criteria, and I've listed that right here for you. So the tasks have to have a true purpose and a real audience. In other words, it has to be a real world task that they're, they're, they're addressing. It needs to be transdisciplinary, which means we have to involve multiple subject areas. And the measurement has to be of standards throughout all of those subject areas. It has to be inquiry-based, which means it has to involve some sort of research. It has to involve an elaborate communication, both with the audience as well as with peers, the teacher, and any mentors that are involved. It needs to involve some reflection, so students have to engage in self-assessment, um, and they have to be able to receive feedback from the audience, from peers, from the teacher, and from mentors. And there has to be some choice involved in terms of what they're doing, how they're doing it, and what they're producing. Uh, and that's because that supports the uh, engagement, meaningfulness, and, and relevance of what they're doing. Do you have um, any examples? 
Yes, I'm going yeah. to read them oh, in good. one okay. minute. Absolutely. Okay. Actually, what I wanted to do was to talk about the issue of rigor, and then I'll, I'll give you some examples. So when we talk about rigor, because I had mentioned that word rigorous before, um, I think sometimes that we construe rigor too narrowly. What rigor is not is more of the same thing. It's not a curriculum with more of what we're already doing. You know, we don't, you know, four years of math and science versus three, or reading ten novels versus five. That's not real rigor. True rigor is when students are um, deeply immersed in the subject over time, and where they're using very sophisticated texts and tools and language to address very complex, messy problems that don't have clear answers or solutions. And they're very often doing this alongside of expert practitioners who serve as mentors, and their work is um, open to public and peer scrutiny. Um, and that's what performance assessments are really about. And that's why, that's our way of trying to get to the issue of rigor. Now in terms of some examples, I just wanted to read a couple to you. So students identify and conduct research on selected environmental issues that can be addressed at the local level. They conduct extensive research on the availability of existing children's literature on those issues. They meet with the children's book publisher to discuss the specific publication demands for producing and marketing children's literature. They write a children's book on their environmental issue and test market, in, test market it in school. They revise their book based upon their test marketing and then submit it to a children's book publisher. So that would be an example of a performance. Another would be, students watch and discuss a film on the Holocaust. They read Night by Elie Wiesel and write a personal response to the author. They then engage in a classroom discussion on human behavior and on the tendencies that supported fascism and Nazism. Students read The Wave by Todd Strasser or examine current data on extremist groups. They write an editorial on the extent to which the rights of such, of such groups should be protected. Finally, among the class, they select two or three of the best editorials and submit them to the local newspapers. So in thinking about those, you can see, if you go back to that uh, prior slide, how it would meet each of those criteria. So you take the current curriculum. Yes. And you say, within this current curriculum, how can we develop a an performance assessment, assessment of yes. that curriculum area? Right. It's to take an integrated set of standards from across disciplines and to develop a real-world task that will measure some important outcomes. Yeah, it's more than one curriculum, so it wouldn't oh, just okay. be language okay. arts, it would be language arts, social studies and science, or science and art. What we're looking at at the elementary level for the group that I'm working with is a, uh, some cross-disciplinary work in terms of literacy, social studies, and technology. Well, I know that there's things already, like at Middlebrook, they yes. use the Oregon Trail, right. for example, and that's a cross-disciplinary thing that, yes. as you were reading these, that's what was coming to my mind. Yes. So you could take something that already exists yes. like that and build it more into a yes. performance assessment and Actually, that's project. what I was going to share with you. We actually okay. have a rubric that we can use to evaluate existing um, performance assessments okay. or create new ones from. Okay. And that you know, kind of helps us. Those dimensions are listed here, and there's a performance continuum so that we can figure out how to do that. Okay. Okay. Um, so why do we want to do performance assessments? Well, they really transform the way teachers do teaching and learning. You can't assess what you don't teach, right? We have this thing in, in education called understanding by design. It's basically a backwards design process. So what we're trained to do is when, once we figure out what we want to teach, the first thing we do is to develop an assessment. And from that flows the learning experiences that will help students to become successful on the assessment. So if we have a challenging, rigorous, integrated assessment, from that will flow appropriate learning experiences for the student. You know, th that's the problem with paper and pencil tests, is that teachers develop learning experiences so kids do well on paper and pencil tests. Um, where we really want students who are able to do real world problems and issues. Um, it also measures what we value. We talk about the importance of creativity, innovation, and persistence. The paper and pencil tests don't measure that. Performance tests give us uh, the ability to start getting a foothold in how to get a handle on those, those particular abilities. And you know, 
students. You know, decontextualized learning, which is much of what we do in education, really kind of leaves kids in the lurch when it comes to having to apply what they, what they learn in school uh, in real world contexts. And so again, I think performance assessment is a way to start bridging the gap between what we learn in school and what kids are going to be doing in college and, and careers. This strikes me as putting a significantly heavy burden on the teachers <laughs> and being very time demanding on the teachers. Because today, you have teachers here in the high school who are who live by the fill in the fill in the circle, or automatically score the test, and that's there every day. That's what they're doing. Okay. Uh, this it changes that dynamic entirely. Yes, it does. Purposefully. Well, I understand, yeah, and I understand that, but what, is, what, as you begin now to introduce this, what has the reaction been among the teachers? Because this changes their workload dramatically. We've been very careful about approaching this. Um, we're only uh, starting okay. with two teams, and it's only one performance assessment. My hope is that over time, as we develop greater proficiency, this is something that will grow to other schools and to other subject areas and become part of what we do. But it's going to be a very slow process. Well, well, I think the, the training, it has pages. implications for how people are trained. Because, and, and the training is, is changing where, where these young people that are coming, or have just recently come out of UConn or some of the great schools that we hire from, have been trained in this methodology. So it would be easier than for those who haven't have been used to doing, as you said, the, yeah. what they've always done. But I have so to it has say big the, implications. The group that's involved is very jazzed by this. They find it very interesting. It makes the work that we're doing very meaningful. Nobody wants to train kids to answer paper and paper mm -hmm. pencil tests. Um, we, this has, what would you say? Well, we, we had the um, assistant superintendent from Weston come um, share with the tech advisory committee. and. What he shared, the, the kind of aha moment, where you think there might be resistance, is that the teachers who didn't do it in the grade levels that hadn't had their performance assessments were actually jealous when they saw what was going on because the kids were so engaged and so passionate about what they were doing and so um, blowing them away with what they could do that they, they actually had to push up their schedule for developing performance assessments because everyone, the parents, the students demanded it. Because if you did it in third grade and it wasn't one in fourth grade, mm -hmm. every third grader kept asking the teacher, "Why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we? Why aren't we?" So, if done well, that may be less of an issue than you think. Well, I hope so. I, I, it really, is, it's a great process. There's no mm -hmm. question about it. But it's <coughs> very dramatically different from what we do yes. today. Dramatically different. Yeah. And One of the things, are very slow. Chuck, you know, it's starting slow is important and providing the support too. I think you, it's unfair to people to roll something out and say you just figured it out. <clears throat> so we really have to consciously and, and systematically prepare people. I think one of the, the things about this that's very exciting too, and Chuck mentioned at the beginning, this is done through the Tri-State Consortium. Uh, and I, I, I don't know, we haven't had much time to talk about uh, the consortium. But it's a, a group of 45 high-performing high school districts. And the, the synergy that, that occurs when, the, when you get together with colleagues from all over the tri-state area is terrific. And, and uh, there's so many outstanding, just to have a bank of assessments mm -hmm. that have been developed and field tested over years, perhaps, is going to help us with teachers where, it's not, where they don't have to begin to you know, invent the, the wheel. Uh, from the beginning, so uh, I think that that will, that will help with the uh, implementation curve. So, so Chuck's covered the the what and the why for for Patty, and I'm going to kind of give you the how. So, where where we our teams are right now in the journey. So, uh, we started in January, and that was session one, and our teams met, and the you'll kind of you'll kind of get the framework that the first three sessions here are really about building that foundation um, so that the things that uh, Chuck described about what it should be, that we have a shared understanding of the language and we have a shared understanding of where we're going. So we all know what the goal is so that in the summer when we come to write them, we are all on the same page. So day one, um, we had to come to a shared understanding of what makes a quality performance assessment. And, um, you know, 
as Chuck shared with you, what they look like, we viewed some videos. And the power of watching videos is you got to hear the students talk about their learning and about how this was different and where they took their own learning. Um, in uh, the other piece of that is understanding what really the components are, kind of breaking it down. So we talked about what cognitive engagement means. How would you know that students are engaged? And we really had a, um, we, we built a, um, a, a sort of a community discussion about cognitive engagement and constructivist learning. How do you construct learning? And at the end of that day, the groups actually created uh, visuals of what performance assessment was. And it was sort of, you know, each group, it was actually very creative, and each group had their own sort of style of what did it. But you could see that we all had a shared understanding. If you looked at every picture and you listened to every group describe what performance assessment was um, based on cognitive engagement constructivist, we were really all there at the end of the day. Um, in session two uh, was about assessment. And it was really started with a kind of a critical understanding of the assessments we give. And so it's sort of a little bit of a self-analysis about the amount of times that teachers give students assessments about learning, it was really assessment of learning. Did you understand what I taught you? You get some data back. Um, and what we're discovering, uh, what the kind of understanding is that there's very little that students do with that. The students kind of understand, I got a grade, I got 80%. Teachers say, okay, he understands 80% of what I gave him. But the difference between that, which is assessment of learning, and then assessment for learning, is the deep understanding of we both have a goal of a um, complex problem, and I'm part. I'm working on the journey, and it's uh, more of a conversation. The student is reflective about what they're learning, and the teacher gets data about how well the students are learning, and the student gets data about where they are, and it's a shared conversation. The amount of data you get, and there is no grade. The student actually ends up more motivated to learn based on that type of assessment feedback. They call that assessment for learning. Um, the second piece um, was talking about diversified. So we talked about how many times we assess learning, but it's for what purpose. And so teachers kind of had an opportunity to reflect about formative versus summative assessment. Formative is that day to day, are you understanding, can I make an adjustment in my lesson? The summative is that end of chapter test. But we took even deeper and we dug deeper into that to understand what types of assessment teachers typically give. Are we giving assessments about information? Are we really having diversified assessments? Do we, do we uh, um, just test that they can recall information that we give them? Do we test that they can um, produce a product? Or we, do we give opportunities to assess their performance? And the last one is the process. Do we assess how they're learning? And when you reflect upon that, do we have a balanced and diverse way of assessing? And you know, we're standing in a room full of really accomplished teachers from high-performing districts, and there was pretty good consensus that we didn't do a good enough job, even in these terrific districts of high-performing students, that we can do better. And that was really, I think, led us into the very end part about authenticity. Um, Chuck already alluded to authenticity is a task that has a real audience that is, um, you know, uh, <coughs> are, are rather than sort of artificial thing. So I'll give you sort of a little science example. So an artificial science example would be having a student demonstrate that they understand the atomic weight of selenium. A authentic assessment would be students actually going out to determine the salinity of a salt marsh and determine the impact on the growth of certain species of fish. So you're still assessing student learning, but there is a much broader um, level of data that you gather from authenticity and the students care about it. So students then 
assess their own learning about where am I in this journey, how am I impacted by this, and that level of authenticity also causes them to really care passionately about what they're doing. Um, at the end of session two, which is sort of our lead up to session three, and I just wanted to just sort of tee it off before I talk about the, the gallery walk, uh, it was determined that we wanted to get student feedback. So it was very important that the student voice become part of this. So our teams just completed them. They actually just started reviewing them today. They interviewed students and we got a diverse group of students, students who are kind of troublemakers, students who are high performing students, students who struggle, maybe some uh, students with special needs. And we asked them some um, probing questions. Um, tell us about a time when you've made a different, when your learning has made a difference. Tell us about um, a time uh, where uh, you struggled with learning. And tell us about learning that really you understood and impacted your understanding. Um, the, the, what you listen and when you hear students talk about what they want out of their learning, the first child, the first video I listened to was they weren't challenged enough. I mean, people get w worried about the aspect that it's too hard. And, the, and this third grade girl talked about the, how much she really wants to be challenged when she's in school. And so I, I have a feeling that when, when uh, Dr. Smith and I review all of these, we're going to have um, some eye-opening moments about listening to what students want from us. And that's going to shape our work as we go forward. These were Wilton kids at you? Yes. Okay. And we're actually, it's going to be part of a gallery. They gave their, their parents gave permission for us to use this. We're going to put these videos together and play them. And the, all the com, uh, districts that are participating will be having their student voices up there. And so we'll really get an understanding of what students in these types of districts are looking for uh, in their learning. Not worrying about performance assessments, right. but about how we teach and the kinds of learning experiences that they want. Um, we actually had a little bonus um, before session three because of three snow days. Um, it happened to fall that they were having a gallery walk. So they were going to display. Um, almost like a science fair, these performance assessments from the cohorts one and two. So we had an opportunity to bring our teams and see some finished products. As part of that learning, we got an extra session of professional development. Dr. Smith and I as facilitators got to participate um, in, in how we give feedback as facilitators to grow the work of our teams. So. Um, the, the real, I think, the real great takeaway about that day was um, we got to view the feedback that some teams had given other teams in previous years and really come up with some shared language and to see um, what we'll be doing with our teams. So we got to see what uh, an, a first draft looks like versus a finished draft and how the comments helped move along a, a group. So it was a valuable day, and it was also valuable to actually walk around the gallery. I wanted to share with you um, a real example. I, the, not that Chucks weren't real, but these, this is an actual example of a performance assessment from the cohort. This is from cohort two, and it's a sixth grade middle school example from New Canaan. And uh, in their science curriculum, they learn about watersheds, and they to determine these were their essential questions. If you can't see it, is it there and should we care? What's worth changing, celebrating, and conserving? And can sixth graders impact their own town? They developed the Sachs Watershed Awareness Task Force and students began by researching their own family's contribution to the local body of water. They actually collected scientific data about the watershed and the <coughs> chemical compounds that are being washed into the water in New Canaan. 
They developed models to show the movement of materials through the watershed. And finally, they did determine an action plan to present the information um, with the design of a tool to measure the impact. Um, and you see that they actually determined that they were going to have an authentic audience of their um, actual town waste management team. And so they got to present to them their findings. So where we are in the journey on April 10th, we will have our session three. And session three for us, we're going to be viewing those videos that the students gathered. And as Chuck uh, indicated, there is a framework for how we do this. So the, the point is to have congruence so that as we build our performance assessment, we're building them all on the same standards, that they are um, valid, that they are going to assess the essential questions that we say they're going to assess, and that they're aligned with the Common Core State standards. So, you know, that fear that we're going to create some terrific learning experience, but it's going to be an add-on where it would Im impact or impair teachers' ability to do their job is should be mitigated by the fact that these are aligned to the Common Core State standards. So all those standards that we're required to teach and that deep learning that we assess with the SBAC test is going to be covered by the work they do. And this probably goes above and beyond it because it's ass assessing difficult things that are difficult to measure in the SBAC, like dealing with ambiguity and um, persistence and things like that. So we'll be going through the templates and tools, and that's really going to lead us to our summer work, which is as soon as school gets out, June 30th to July 2nd, and we will have three full days of developing our own performance assessments. Um, the facilitators will work, collaborate with each other, giving feedback to all of the group's work, and um, and the um, expectations that we're going to be um, com performing these during the school year next year and that when the tri-state consultancy group comes in January this will be the basis of that consultancy so they will be giving us feedback on the level to which we have um, completed our tasks. How many um, performance assessments do you expect to have developed to. And for which grade levels would they be for? Uh, right now it's fifth and eighth grade. Fifth, and the entire grade will, or no? Well, that's a, a matter of debate. Head. Right now, okay. right now we, we want to do it with just the people in yeah, on the PADI team. We're, so uh, their classes. It's okay. really important that we um, implement this the first time with the people who were trained and that they share kids. Um, again, later on as we grow this, which is my intention, what, what I'm really hoping that at some point we can develop are what are known as capstone projects. So perhaps in second, fifth, eighth, or maybe eleventh grade, students will perform these very um, involved and elaborate capstone projects that will integrate their learning from that particular level. So basically at Sutter Mill, one fifth grade house will be doing this, and at Middlebrook, one eighth grade color team For next year? will be doing this. It's only the three teachers involved. So those teachers, and they will share students, um, those, those are the teachers who will implement it. It's not by house, it's by that group. And it's, it's not every student in the class. No. Well, it's every student. You know, it's, it's every student in the class that they have, not all the kids in the house. Does that make sense? Okay, so we have, for instance, we have <laughs> Terry Cedro, Tim Lai, and Andy, Andy Cloutier. Cloutier. They share a certain group of students. Those are the students that will participate in this. They teach what? Those three? Um, social studies. Social studies and STEM. STEM. And, STEM. and then uh, Tim, Tim is the tech person. So there will be some tech component to it as well. Okay. Again, starting very small. Right, okay. Any other questions? Just want to find out how many hours have we invested so far in developing these assessments? Well, we've only been through the training, which has been two days so far. And then the one day of the gallery, one and the day of the gallery. So three days? Yeah. For seven professionals? Yes. The, the, uh, facil the, it was not four full days, though the, the, um, gallery walk, the, it was a half day for the, the teachers. They didn't, 
Um, they taught their regular classes. So far, pretty modest investment. Yes. Yeah. And two assessments <coughs> next year, just uh, two of the fifth and eighth graders. Yes. And total kids are under 100. Excuse me. Probably um, 30 or so. Yeah, probably about 30. In ours elementary. It's going to be like literacy social studies combined. Right. So it's kind of hard to say right now because we haven't actually developed the assessment. I figured under 100 was close. You're, yes. you're, you're, you're close. <laughs> For the pilot. Thank you very much. Next, under the act, under action items, and a, a review of the set security task force recommendations. Right. During uh, the course of this year, as you know, the town security task force has been hard at work. Uh, we're well represented. Ken and, and John Murphy and Jory Higgins, I believe, are, and Roseanne D. Simone represent the Milton schools. Um, and they've been, as you know, formulating uh, some recommendations for the town and for the schools. Uh, one of the recommendations, the recommendations come in the form of some personnel to address cultural issues in the school. And, and you've heard about those in, 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 as they're part of our, uh, currently part of our operating budget, the school resource officer and the threat assessment coordinator. And uh, they were part of the budget proposal that uh, uh, we currently have moving forward in the process. The second set of recommendations deals with the uh, modification of the school buildings. And uh, at your uh, March 13th executive session, you were briefed by the uh, Security Task Force uh, chair and, and uh, a couple of members. And uh, during that session, uh, they uh, shared some of the details uh, about the proposed $500,000 bonded uh, project that would enhance security, designed and enhance to harden the facilities a little bit. It's what they, the term of art they use is harden. Uh, but their, their facility uh, investments, uh, one of the reasons that we, by law we, we can do that in executive sessions, we don't want to talk publicly about the security devices and, and protocols that we are going to put in place or that we're proposing to put in place. Um, the board, I felt, I thought you all asked a lot of very thoughtful uh, questions, probing questions about that. Uh, we were lucky to have some very skilled and knowledgeable professionals uh, in working in the world of security, uh, helping provide some uh, responses. I hope, I hope you felt that you got good uh, information. Um, tonight, uh, uh, we, uh, we wanted to just, uh, as part of our uh, capital uh, bonded proposal that will go to the town, we, we needed to get the board's uh, uh, approval to uh, um, move this forward uh, uh, in, in May, which was, as you recall, was uh, uh, outlined to you when, when, when you met uh, on the 13th. So having said that, it's just a matter of, uh, we, we don't ever vote in executive session, but the feeling was that we need, uh, the, the, the law reads that, that votes need to take place uh, in uh, public session. So we wanted to, uh, to have you uh, uh, determine whether or not you feel comfortable going pushing this forward um, in, in uh, compliance with the recommendations of the task force okay. uh, in May at the town uh, meeting. Yeah, I I left that meeting, the executive session meeting, just so impressed with the, the work that has been done by these volunteers, and just you know they've left no stone unturned when it comes to security and. Um, wholeheartedly endorse with what, what they've come up with. No, it was nice to see that everything, I think, um, you know, in town as a parent, no one wants to talk about the things we notice, but they certainly covered any thing yeah. I was ever, have ever, I've been nervous about at the school. So yeah. That was very, yeah, anyone else? Interesting. Sure, a motion yeah, to yeah, approve motion. the uh, security guest board recommendation. So. I second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Okay. Um, we have reached the end of our meeting. Would anyone from the public care to come and make a comment? Yes. Great. Brian Kesselman, uh, Board of Ed Liaison for Wilton Education Foundation. I just wanted to uh, say thank you to Dr. Richards for recognizing our programs. Acoustic Wilton, which was very, very successful this past weekend. If you haven't had a chance, I'd recommend that you all go 
on YouTube and search for Acoustic Wilton and you will see the fantastic talent that we have in mostly our high school but also some middle school students and some Wilton local professionals who help them. Uh, and there are now four years of uh, assorted videos from different concerts that they've done. Uh, and of course, uh, Acoustic Wilton also sells their CDs. You <laughs> jump in on that. Um, and we have, we have that race, uh, the 5K coming up. Uh, we just, of course, had the uh, career day at Middlebrook. We've got a lot of exciting programs. Uh, we're currently in the process of discussing having some people from WEF come in and do a, a dog and pony for you, a little bit of a, a show about all of our programs and, and how we're uh, working for the benefit of the school. I'm hoping to get that on a, a near-term agenda with the Board of Ed, but I uh, need to coordinate it internally first. So be on the lookout for that, and, and thanks for all the help from the administration and, and the staffs of the schools and all the volunteers. Uh, it, it's been a great relationship from our standpoint, and, uh, and we really enjoy it. Thank you. Thank you. Is Real World is, is it next next week, isn't it? And yeah. That's yeah. the career day at the high school. And, and again, I talked to you about the one at Middlebrook, and it was fabulous. The high school one is, is equally impressive. And yeah. I think our kids really ask great questions. And to hear men and women from all different types of professions uh, uh, can give them some insights. And, and we're always looking for suggestions from anybody about ways that we can interact more tightly with students, staff. Uh, we did a focus group with a number of teachers, administrators, and students uh, that came up with some really innovative ideas about how we can do little tweaks to some of our programs, like uh, Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader or Acoustic Wilton to involve more people. But anything, including the professional development uh, requests that come in, uh, students that have projects that that have a broad reach uh, that could use some extra funding. Um, again, focusing on that technology, professional uh, professional growth, and uh, but our goal is to help Wilton schools continue to uh, perform well. And, and you know, anybody that has any thoughts is always welcome to come to one of our meetings. Shoot uh, info at WiltonEducationFoundation.org an email. Uh, or see me on usually as these board meetings. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, is there a motion to adjourn? No? No, we're going to stay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make the motion. And I'll, and I'll approve it. Thank you. <laughs>